Welcome everyone to the AM Book Club. This is the webinar series. This actually is our ninth edition. Um, so we are, we are slowly getting into our first milestone, running 10, 10 um, episodes of this, of this webinar series. Um, and I'm your host, Andrew Mutua. Before we begin, I'd like to share some housekeeping rules. Uh, please ensure you mute um, your mic um, and also uh, turn off your video just to avoid distractions. Um, if you have access to a quiet room, please do make, um, take advantage of that and uh, make use of it so that you avoid any disruptions during the sessions. You have to ensure that you're fully present to take uh, full advantage of this, of, this, uh, of this session. And with that, let's get this show right on the road. Um, get this up. Uh, so before we begin, for those that might be um, joining us for the first time, I'll just take, I'd like to take a moment and introduce them to the AM Book Club. Um, so the AM Book Club is really a community of book lovers, people that love to read and to continually develop themselves. Um, we really build on these three key principles. Books. Uh, books are really um, a channel through which you we self-educate ourselves. We learn from others. We uh, develop relationship with mentors either near with us or even far away. So books is really a good way to continually develop yourself. The second pillar is mindset. Uh, mindset is really premised on ways in which, you know, we can develop mindsets that serve us best, um, develop mindset that help us live at the best versions of our lives every single day. And finally, business. I think we each have a profession, uh, a career, uh, either we run our own business and we need to continually develop and figure out ways in which we can always be able to deliver value uh, in exchange for money. Uh, and through business, we get to learn a lot of things. And through this uh, webinar series, this is one way we continually develop ourselves on that uh, sphere of our lives. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Alternate Limited. Alternate Limited is uh, an ICT firm um, that is uh, whose mission is really um, helping organization enhance their productivity by digitizing their business operations. Uh, we've been in business for the last seven years. We serve uh, the mid to large size uh, business end of uh, spectrum um, and this cuts across various sectors from financial services to manufacturing to non-profits across the board we really help organization really move from a paper-based manual-based processes or systems to more of an online digital business processes which help them do more with less have been in the it ICT space for the last 15 or so years, having worked across various uh, sectors. I started off in the uh, telco area, went into a bit of the hospitality, and more recently in the non-profit sector before I took the plunge and went into running my own business. I am also a blogger and uh, you can find me on andimutua.com. This is where I, write, I, I, I review books, I read and review books and uh, you find quite a host of uh, them. I'll actually be putting out uh, a review of uh, Daisy's book, Beyond Eight to Five, The Critical Lessons by Retrenchy. So look out for that. Um, and you can find me um, or you can contact me through those channels, my email address, my company website, or through my blog. And with that, let's go straight to it. Uh, uh, our session for today. Wow, this has been someone I've been looking for for quite a while. She's quite been uh, hard to get. Um, and, and really this speaks to um, uh, somebody who is really quite uh, involved in a number of things, Daisy. 
Um, she is an author. Um, she is the founder of the 8 to 5 uh, initiative. Um, she's also a Rotarian. Um, and she is the president of the Rotary Club of Nairobi South. Um, so you can imagine she really juggles quite a bit. And she's also a wife and a mother. Uh, and, and I could bet she has quite a number of other things that she's handling um, that uh, really take up her time. And, and really, it's a pleasure to have Daisy come speak to us. She has quite a powerful story, um, which she documented in her book called uh, Beyond 8 to 5, Critical Lessons by Ari Trenchy, um, where she spoke about her experiences and, uh, and the lessons she gleaned out of it following um, um, the episode where she left, she got retrenched from her job. Um, and I look forward to what she'll be sharing with us because it's really from that that uh, she was able to learn quite a bit and uh, she has been really on a mission to help quite a number of people that either might end up into that situation. We all know change happens. We are now in the midst of this global pandemic and uh, change has been forced on us. Uh, and that's, that's the time you think of, you know, what next. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this session. And with that, I would like to welcome Daisy Nyaga to come speak to us on this topic of building fallback plans. Karibu sana, Daisy. All right. Um, thank you very much, Andy Mutua. Um, I'm greatly honored, greatly honored to appear in this webinar, webinar which is uh, your ninth edition. I have been following the great guests that you have uh, been bringing us, and we end Sorry, okay. Daisy, I think I muted you by mistake. So go ahead. Okay. Never mind. So I was just saying um, I totally appreciate this opportunity to um, speak in this webinar. And um, really, I look forward to an engaging session, a session where you will not just learn, but there will be transformation. That everybody on this call will leave this webinar ready to take an action, ready to change an aspect of their lives, ready to you know implement an aspect of change that will leave them in a better position than i was so if you allow me i think i'll just share my screen and then we get started and i'm happy to see two of my incoming members in rotary that is uh, i think lona i've seen lona and uh, rosemary I'm so happy to see you here as we continue this journey of learning and uh, growing together. So Andy, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, I'll be taking us through what I'm calling building fallback plans amidst life's uncertainties. And uh, there could not be a more relevant period than this to talk about this, you know, fallback plans. So my objective at the end of my 15, 20 minutes is that we will all understand why we need a fallback plan. And number two, we all need to understand how we can establish one in the event of either a job or a business loss. Okay, so this is not just relevant to employed people, employees, but business people as well, because your business employs you, your business is a source of your, of your living. So I want us to approach it with an open mind. And uh, at some point, I know I'll be doing a very short su survey, and I request that we all participate, it is anonymous, because that will help us to best understand uh, what that it is that we are talking about. So very briefly, my story, I once worked with an airline, Kenya Airways, as a flight attendant. Uh, if you see shiny foreheads, this must have been a, a, a night flight, probably from Europe, and all the passengers must be deeply asleep. Eh? But we are trying to keep our smiles going in the gully. The gully is the um, kitchen in the aeroplane. So I worked there for seven years, but unfortunately, that came to a very abrupt end in 2012 when we were suddenly retrenched. And I say sudden because, as for me, I reported from a flight. 
I was coming from Amsterdam and on landing into Nairobi, I got a message that there was a very urgent meeting. And uh, lo and behold, we went for a meeting at two o'clock and we got our retrenchment letters. So it was that sudden. So in the morning you're on duty, by two o'clock you're no longer on duty. There are those of us who actually left their houses, they went to report at the airport, but their names were not on the check-in list. That is how sudden it was. There are those who that day, they woke up, they checked in, maybe they got to the airport around 6 a.m., they went through the airport check-in, but by the time they got to the flight, they realized their name was not on the manifest. You know, the manifest is what shows the list of the crew that is accompanying that flight. And there were harrowing um, experiences but out of that, I am able to sit here with all the confidence and share with you a nugget or two on how that we all can build fallback plans. I have to go through some of the very bad experiences that I went through. So that's just to lay foundation of my experience, my retrenchment experience, and why I'm so passionate about engaging people and speaking to people and inspiring people to create fallback plans for themselves. So besides my story of retrenchment, I just wanted to highlight some grim statistics, grim stats, you know, the last about 10, 11 years. We have had hundreds of companies lay off and now this is before covid so forget covid let's look at before covid what was the situation like in 2018 alone we had about um, 11 out of 40 banks grow their bottom lines which means the rest which is over about two-thirds did not grow their bottom lines and that ultimately will affect the people working or the other employees of that company, or even the investors, all right? Eight out of 10 banks cut over a thousand staff. We know all these statistics. I know we have some bankers on board. Echo Bank closed a third of their branches. That is 2018. 18 other firms out of the NSC listed firms actually posted losses. That is about a third as at that point. 22 of them posted dropped profits. Now the year before, that was the year we went for election, also we had the same trend where 29 out of 57 listed companies cut jobs. And remember, I'm only talking of NSC listed firms. So this is like the cream de la cream of the companies operating in our economy. Only 13 hired. All right, so that just gives you a very grim reality of what the situation and the economic um, uh, reality is on ground. Again, just a quick run through over the last 10 years, many companies have closed down, they've retrenched. You can see the list there, and it's barely a drop in the ocean. All right, so when we understand what has been happening, you can see there has been a trend of companies changing their operational models, their business models, companies taking up um, technology, digitizing their operations, and hence the need for less manpower. And that is what is making people um, so desperate because you're in a comfort zone, you're used to your normal income cycle, your salary comes on the 5th or on the 30th or on the 22nd for the bankers and other blue chip companies, but that is changing. And so unless you're blind to the reality, we will be caught uh, pants down, you know, and hence why I'm very passionate about talking about fallback plans. So what's a fallback plan really? Um, in just a layman's um, language, I would say it's your plan B. What's your plan B if A fails? 
what's your plan C if plan A and B fails? What's your plan D if A, B, and C fail, you know? So I want us to just take a minute and think through what would happen if you lost your income today. I'll tell you what happened to me very briefly. A lot of changes had to happen. And Andy, if you'll allow me, I'll want to just send a small link on uh, the chat where, where people can just take a minute. It only has five questions. So you'll allow me to stop screen sharing so that I send the link on the chat. And then I'll request that people take their time to just fill in uh, that, uh, to fill in that link. It only has five questions and it is anonymous. So please answer them honestly because that will, um, that will help us to engage on a very realistic level of where we are all at. So as I share the link with you, I'll tell you a few things that happened to me when I lost my income. Like I said, a lot of changes took place and the change was actually a downgrade. So the biggest change for me was actually starting to downgrade your life to fit the near zero income. Daisy, Where have you shared have you shared the link? Sorry to interrupt. I don't see. No, no, it's, it's I'm just, um, I just want to retrieve it as I speak. So I don't okay. want a vacuum. Okay. Yeah, I'm just accessing my Google forms so that I just share the link shortly. But as I do so, I just want to keep sharing what life was like when I lost my income. Because then that is what will awaken you to the reality of not having a fallback plan. So as I was saying, number one is a downgrade. I had to downgrade my life. A lot of things had to change because the income that I was used to was no longer coming in. And remember, after this um, retrenchment, the union headed to court. And when the union goes to court, of course, what happens is that um, you have to wait for the case to end before we can access our monies, all right? So during that time, while the case is going on, imagine, what, it, what, what will we feed on? How are people paying their rents? How are people meeting obligations for their children? How are people helping their families for those who are dependent, all right? So I've sent that link. It only has five very simple questions. So I want you to just take one minute as I talk to just keep, um, to answer those questions. Very honestly, it's anonymous and I'll just share the responses. They're all anonymous. So to just see the reality, okay? So the change that happened for me was a downgrade, all right? And when this downgrade happens, it is degrading it brings about feelings of depression, you know? Because now what you were used to before is no longer tenable. And it's not easy to change lifestyles, especially if it is sudden, all right? Great, so back to our screen sharing. So as you fill those forms, it will just ask you questions related to what would happen if you lost your income today and if i could just read through the first question i want you to i want to provoke your thoughts and ask you would you still be able to pay school fees for your children in the same school that they are in enjoying all the amenities that they still enjoy school bus i don't know what games you know would you still be able to do that if you lost your income today six months down the line one year down the line would you still be able to meet that obligation without having found another job? Okay, so that's the question. Question number two, six months down the line or one year down the line, would you still afford the rent for where you're living currently if you lost your job today and you haven't found another job? Question number three, in case you have a car that you use, you own a car, Six months down the line, one year down the line, 
in case you lost your job today or your business income, would you be able to still maintain that car in the same state that you maintain it? Servicing it on, um, I mean, timely, you know, fueling it, driving it around to whatever uh, um, events that you go to, would you still be able to do that? Generally, would you be able to maintain your current living standards? Remember, this is an if question. I just want you to think through your position, whether you're in business, whether you're employed. Would you be able to maintain the general kind of living standard? Your charitable uh, donations, normally you'll bless people with something, they'll call you, please idea me with this amount. Would you be able to do that six months down the line, one year, if you lost your job and you haven't found another job? All right? So I believe you have taken a minute or two to just answer those questions. The anonymous, I'll just share the, the, the answers much later so that we all come to the reality of how much we are living on the edge, you know, and how unprepared most of us are of sudden life's occurrences. Now, remember, when we are building fallback plans, it's not just about your salary, it's not about your business income. These changes could come out of a health challenge. One minute, you're whole. The next minute, somebody has been involved in an accident and they're no longer able to work. They're no longer able to go to business. One minute, you're healthy. The next minute, you have a, a serious diagnosis. So when you're talking of fallback plans, let us look at an all-round uh, view of our lives. It's beyond the monies. So that is the survey. I'll display the answers much later so that we all laugh at ourselves or congratulate ourselves depending on how prepared we are to face life's uncertainties. So the question is, you have seen the grim statistics. I have shared a brief of my story. So the question is, what do we do? COVID has come. So you can imagine the grim statistics are even grimmer, if there's such an English word. The situation is getting dire. Business models are changing. We've seen a shift to near total uh, digital operations. Banks have closed branches because now the distribution channel has become online banking and, um, and mobile banking, you know? So there's so many dynamics that's changing. And the question is, what do you do? And my answer to that, and my challenge tonight, is that you take full charge of your life. Taking full charge means you take responsibility. You get to a point to tell yourself, yes, this is the reality on ground. My company could, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, a, it's unexpected, anything could happen. My business cash flows could change and I am aware of that fact. But despite of all these uncertainties, I will choose not to be caught unawares. I will choose to take steps that will leave me in a much better position to handle any of these uncertainties. So that is my challenge for you tonight. So when we talk of fallback plans, we are talking of your plan B, your plan C. I just want to give you thoughts and ideas of what some of these fallback plans are. And then you go and sit down with yourself, call yourself for a meeting and decide which one, which way do I take? Because not everybody of us can do one thing, all right? We all have different strengths. We have different uh, capabilities. And so my challenge is after we've discussed all this, you will take time to just go sit down, meditate, look through your strengths, do a SWOT analysis. What are your strengths? What are your um, weaknesses? What opportunities do you have? So in my fallback plans presentation to you, I'll give you two options. I'll share with you two ways to go about it in developing a fallback plan. We say the fallback plan is plan B if A fails or plan C if A and B do not work out. So that means you're always ready with an alternative, you know? So in my first option, 
these are some of the fallback plans you can adapt, but they require operational involvement. You are directly involved in starting this and in making it work for you, all right? And then in option two, we will look at those plans which do not need your operational involvement. So that once you do your analysis of your strengths and capabilities and your weaknesses, then you decide for me, I think let me start off with this one and then I will build on to the other fallback plans. So to start us off, there are some, um, I think I'm showing four options that I want to throw onto you, but all these require you to be actively involved to make it a success and to make it work. Number one, you can decide and purpose to develop yourself, your career, such that even if the worst happens in your workplace or in your business, there's that skill that you have that will make you um, adjust very easily or get onto another opportunity. So I want to challenge every one of us on the call to ask themselves, how can I further develop my profession, my career, you know, my occupation, my vocation? What extra course can I take, you know, just to put me above par, to give me a competitive advantage in the market? What skills do you need to sharpen? What skills do you need to take up? Uh, so with the growth of, uh, for example, the technology, uh, technological advancements currently, any skills around the subject of technology, and I know Andy is a, is a, is a witness to that, that is a highly um, sought after skill, skills around the subject of technology, digital marketing, I don't know, coding, uh, coming up with websites, funnel marketing. So any skill, if you have an interest in technology, you need to take up these skills and sharpen these skills, which are now high in demand. All right. So you can consider your career development as a fallback plan. And I'll tell you one thing, possibly let me use someone like Igathe. At least we all know him. I don't think there's a day Igathe slept without a, a job offer on his table. Yeah, because I believe he's a valuable employee to have. So the moment he leaves X, he leaves equity, he leaves Vivo, he's jumping onto another blue chip equity. He leaves equity, I don't know, um, NMS, Nairobi County, want him. The moment he thinks of leaving, somebody else has already taken him up. I want to challenge you. Are you a valuable employee? Are you a valuable employee? And I always tell people, and I tell myself, be like that dream house girl, you know? For the ladies on the call and even men, we all dream of having this wonderful DM, domestic manager, our house girl, who will take charge, even if you didn't tell them what to cook, you're hoping that when you come home, they've already cooked, they've sorted the menus, they took responsibility. So are you that kind of an employee in your workplace? Where you entrusted with a role, are you that kind of a person? So be valuable in, in your role, be valuable in whatever it is that you do. And I always challenge people and tell them, I know we always complain, Mishara and Nairobi, you know, Nairobi salaries, of course, we always say nobody will ever pay you enough for what you do, that is very true. But I always tell people, work as unto God, as the good book tells us. And God is a rewarder. So be valuable. Take up courses. We have a lot of um, online resources currently. I mean, there's a whole list, Andy, which I have, which I can send you later, of uh, um, universities and um, websites that are offering so many free resources. So take up courses, sharpen your skills, and um, be valuable. So that is the first fallback plan that you can opt to do. Should you lose one job, you're valuable enough to knock onto the next door and you will not be out for long. Great. So number two option that I'm offering is that um, you can consider real estate investments. 
but this again will uh, require your involvement. So Kenyans, I know we're obsessed with buying plots, seeing what to add to plots and developing plots. So my question is, when we get our income and your business income, when you get your profits at the end of the week, at the end of the month, have you thought of putting aside something for such an investment? Oftentimes we say it's very expensive or real estate needs a lot of capital. Could be true, could be false, depending on where you're at. But the thing is, identify what is within your budget and start working towards that. James Mwangi's story really challenges me. Right now we marvel at the hundreds of millions of his worth in equity bank. But has he built that in a day? Has he built that in a year or five years? It is much longer than that. So even for us, as we think of fallback plans, I want to challenge ourselves at the end of this month, yeah, this October, start re-looking at your budget and ask yourself, is this a fallback plan I can consider? That I start putting aside some investments for a rainy day. Again, this is a decision that will need you to look at what you have and uh, what you are able to, to afford. But this is an option that you can consider. I know people that uh, during COVID, they had some plots in some very, you know, far away places, but that has become their lifesaver. They have simply packed out of Nairobi, gone to their plot and put up some abati structures or timber structures or container homes and rent is off their back. The landlord is off their back. So my challenge is let us look into how you can get into real estate investments. You can buy and hold. You never know about tomorrow. If you have the resources, buy and start developing. All right. And that's a topic all on its own. So I move on. Another fallback plan that will require your direct involvement is you can start a business. And nowadays, I don't like calling them uh, hassles. Yeah, we, these are not hassles. Start a business. Don't start a side business. Start a business. Because sometimes when you talk of side businesses, it's like, uh, it's not too important. That's my interpretation. I'll only give it as much effort as, you know, as I want. But when you put your mind into, I want to put my energy my extra time into building a business that can support me fully, then everything changes. How you think about it, how you manage it, how you recruit staff to work in it while you're still working, it changes. And people, it can work. I know a lot of excuses. Oh, you know, Kazi Mushikana Sana, we are too busy. Running a business while still employed cannot work. It can work. And um, whereas I wouldn't say I've reached there, I have walked the journey of doing business while still employed. But it takes a lot of um, um, taking things uh, professionally. Like for me, what works for me is I've outsourced a lot of services. So for those who may already are on my social media platforms beyond eight to five, there's a lot of engagement but I don't do it morning to evening. I have somebody who is specialized in that to manage those platforms. Because if I decided it was a side business, I'll juggle job and I'll juggle the business, it will not work, it will fail. So when you're thinking of starting a side business, think, can I employ somebody and put in place the system for them? You know, guide them, be now the vision bearer. Just as a boss is giving the vision and the setting the systems in your workplace, now be that boss in your business. Empower one person. All they need is your guidance. All right? Job one of the balls will drop. So I am challenging us to think of starting a business, but with a different perspective. The perspective of yes, I will empower one person, two people to run with this. And I am the vision bearer. 
I'll set in place the systems, I will guide them, and I will monitor very keenly. So like for me in my case, every Saturday is when we do reviews. Because I'm not always on Facebook, I'm not always on Twitter, on LinkedIn, but the pages are very active. So on Saturday, we have a sitting with my team. So now, what did we do? What do we need to improve on? Where do you need my support? And then I give the team that. So I am slowly building my business empire while still holding down a full-time job because I learned the hard way. And then uh, finally, uh, you can also consider farming as a fallback plan. And the reason I've separated farming from business is because it's a whole dynamic altogether. But yes, consider farming as a fallback plan and it is a business. When you get into farming, think of it as a business. See your kulima too, because what wanna panda boga. Think of how much money am I putting? What are the input costs? When I go to the market, what's the price range? What are the risks? And will I earn an investment, a return on my investment? So these are some of the options you can consider depending on your strengths and your capacity to build a fallback plan. And then I move to the second option of fallback plans. And these ones have no operational involvement, meaning these are plans you can decide to take up, but somebody else is managing them on your behalf. All that you get is the return on your investment. So very quickly, number one, we all need to set up an emergency fund. I can sing this song 24 hours, set up emergency fund, because I know what happened to me, because I never had an emergency fund. Most of us live month, it's called mouth, hand to mouth. The salary comes, within five days we've distributed it, and then you wait for the cycle. And uh, no pun intended, but uh, I saw something on WhatsApp which says, uh, there are those who earn uh, some incomes are like uh, what we call them menstrual income eh? they call them menstrual income it comes once a month and lasts four or five days so let us move out of that by ensuring we have set up an emergency fund what would this do imagine if you lost your job today but you had saved maybe some a hundred thousand somewhere very basic figure what would that mean it means come the following month, you're not desperate and begging your landlord not to lock your door because you'll just go to your fund. Hi Daisy, are you there? and parent because if you i think we lost you there yes. could you kindly just pick up from where you lost uh, talking about uh, emergency funds okay yeah so i'm saying um we need to set up uh, emergency funds because what it means is should you lose your job or your business income we've heard of business fires cash flows change customer tastes change and you're left with debt talk so if your income flows are affected for whatever reason, whether it's a health issue, it's a job loss, business dynamics, policy changes, I mean, just like it happened with the polythene bags. Some people had so much talk and then the following day it's illegal, for example. That's a policy dynamic that has affected your inflows. So should that happen and you have an emergency fund, this is your fallback plan because it means you're not too desperate to leave tomorrow. You won't be desperate to pay your rent for the following month as you figure out a way out. Your kids will not be kicked out of school because you can't meet the fee obligation. So it's very important that we set up an emergency fund and now uh, we are normally advised to put in about um, three to six months worth of living expenses somewhere where there's a uh, it's easy to, to draw back your cash. Eh? And um, I will mention where those places are towards the end. 
So the second uh, fallback plan you can consider besides an emergency fund, and it doesn't need your involvement, is having relevant insurance policies. It is very unfortunate that in Kenya, and I think in Africa generally, people have a very negative um, mindset about insurance policies. Insurance is not an investment per se, but it covers your risk, all right? So I want you to imagine, let's say you've lost your income or your business has gone down, but you had, um, let's say you had an education policy for your children, maybe for high school, and it's a near to go. What does that mean? It means your children will not miss out on their places in school because the insurance will be able to cover that. Your policy is just about to mature. But remember, when you're paying for these premiums, I mean, you're comfortable. So why not do it? Why not take up policies against fires for business owners? And then what happens if there's a fire? You have the policy to cushion you against the risk that has happened. You're employed. Why don't you take up against retrenchment policies? I had one, and I'm glad because it covered a nine months. Uh, what was this? Um, for those who had loans, it covered nine months of uh, payments on the loan. And there are some retrenchment policies which normally give you three months income or two months salary. Should you be retrenched or you lose your job? So why not take up insurance policies? It's not an investment, but it will give you to cover your risk and give you a sort of starting point. You've heard of uh, guys who've lost their vehicles, which were comprehensively insured. Don't they get back a bit of uh, the money to give them a head start? So think of that in your own life. So ask yourself, where am I exposed? Where is my risk exposed? And what policy can I take to cover that risk? The insurance will become a form of a fallback plan in that eventuality. Um, I move on to number three of an option which does not which does not need your involvement, operational involvement, and these are real estate uh, investments. Remember, in the first option we talked about real estate investments, but these ones needed your operational involvement. You have to go identify and build. But now in the second option, we are looking at um, options that do not really need you to manage them. You know, we have rates. Um, these are a bit technical, but they are just, um, they are offered at the stock exchange. Just investing in specific uh, real estate developments. I will not go into much detail on that. You can also consider off-plan housing purchases which is an excellent um, uh, option. Unfortunately, in our Kenyan market, the investors or providers, a majority of them have not uh, fulfilled their promises. And so this has kept a lot of people off this um, option of a fallback plan. But my challenge is you can consider looking out for one or two companies that um, that have a good name in the market and they are known to deliver and consider that you know you can also consider buying ready developments ready for occupation you know ready homes ready commercial buildings as your fallback plan okay great now where i want to spend just an extra few minutes is um the option of having uh, these passive investments, yeah? Now, money market funds. If you lost your job, um, let's say last month, and you had put in some uh, uh, investment in a money market fund, and you're really, really, really desperate for some money for your food, for your rent, for your school fees, or for any emergency, medical emergency, you're able to access your funds with between 24 to 48 hours in a money market fund. Yeah? 
So that takes you away from having to get into debt, you know, begging and borrowing and the desperation that comes with not having a regular income. So I want to challenge each and every one of us. Starting a money market fund investment is very simple. And it is one of the basic investment options everybody should have, including a mamamboga. Because with as little as a thousand shillings, you can open an account or 2000 shillings. And then you top up according to your ability, either daily, weekly, or monthly, as little as even 500 shillings. So I want to challenge everybody on this call. If you don't have a money market fund, please, you're failing yourself, you're failing your children, and uh, I don't want you to get into the desperation that I got. It is one of the investment options to consider. And the beauty of this is that they compound the interest on a daily basis, and it is a very safe investment for you. Because normally it's, it, um, they invest in what you call secure investments, eh? like government paper. Great, so I'll not get into the details of that in this session, but you can reach out for more uh, guidance. Fixed deposits. Of course, we normally say banks, the interest of banks is very low, which is true. We also have a few um, higher interests for fixed deposits. So you will not be. So this is also an option to consider. Uh, and of course, it means that you do a bit of, um, of your due diligence and your returns on investments to see where to put your money. Another favorite with Kenyans is the circle investments. So your shares, your savings. On a rainy day, this could save your life. Okay, having some circle share somewhere, earning you an interest, I mean, earning you a dividend or some uh, circle saving somewhere that you can always retrieve. It is a fallback plan because, again, the desperation will not be there if the worst comes to the worst. Um, treasury bills and treasury bonds, again, these are very safe in investments that you can consider. And I want to tie the emergency fund with this passive investments. Um, what I normally advise people, those that are engaging and from my experience, you can save your emergency fund in something like the money market fund because that you're able to access within 24 to 48 hours if the worst came to the worst or you can do treasury bills and treasury bonds in that you've lent the government your money and they'll return it to you with an interest. So that's a safe investment, all right? Now the money market fund, what happens, they still save, they still buy these treasury bills and bonds. Only that with the money market fund, they consolidate funds from many, many, many people, from Daisy, Andrew, Coletta. So your 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, when it gets maybe to 500,000 or a million, now they go and buy these treasury bills and bonds from the government. Then when the government pays the interest, then they divide it amongst us, the people who, who gave that collective fund. So in, in a nutshell, that is it. So uh, those are the options I would want to give and to just throw onto you to think through. What is it that you can start doing now? You know, like tomorrow, you open your shop, you make a small profit. Can I open an MMF fund, you know? Can I start considering a policy that you know you need to have, but you've been dismissing somebody because of lack of understanding? So those are the two options. Look through these plans which need you to be directly involved and look through these other options which are managed by somebody else, but they leave you at a better position to pick yourself up in the event of a sudden life um, income loss a sudden health challenge. And um, as I come towards the close, for those of us that um, in workplaces, I want to just uh, 
jog your mind a little bit. I want to challenge you to identify and utilize opportunities at your workplace. Many times we complain, you know, oh, this work, oh, the reporting hours, the boss, you know, the salary is never enough. But there's so, so much more that the workplace offers you that if you have an inner eye, you'll be able to identify and to mine that to your advantage. So some of these things, how many of you have been given sponsored trainings by your employer? Very many. You've always been brought to a training, sponsored to trainings. Do you attend that training just because your employer has paid for it? Have you ever thought that you can start utilizing that knowledge for your own benefit and outside of the workplace? That's a challenge. Your professional networks and contacts. How can you utilize that outside of the workplace to build yourself, to have fallback plans? You know, again, think through all this. There are people with the exchange programs. I know companies that send their staff to other, to their branches across the world or across the county. Maybe you work in Nairobi, you've been sent to Mombasa, you've been sent, I don't know, to Meru. How do you utilize these programs and the knowledge and the experience that you're getting to build yourself outside of the workplace? All right. Company sponsored discounted services and products. Some of you have these benefits. So I'm just challenging you after this. Go and sit down and ask yourself how much it is that I have at the workplace that I have been blind to. You're only looking at the salary. You're like, eh, hey, Mishara and Nairobi man, Aitoshi. Yet you have so much more that you can actually mine and make money from that has been given to you for free. Travel opportunities. What do you do when you're sponsored on travel? Do you just go mumbling and grumbling? These guys are sending me out on a Saturday. I should be home with my family. Yes, that's a price to pay. But look at the positive. Who are you meeting on these travels? What contact are you making? What are you learning? What can you bring from out there? the ideas, product, services. So there's so much more. Um, research and new development opportunities. Maybe your company has, I mean, maybe you're in that line of research and development for your company. Is there a way that you can use some of that knowledge to benefit you without a conflict of interest? I know of somebody who's now doing business, I think in four African countries, because the company he works for uh, put so much money in research and development, then a new management came and said, you know what, we are not proceeding with that. The guy has run away with whatever findings came out because it was trashed by the new government. As we speak, he's dealing in thousands, no, millions of dollars because he ran away with that information and he has implemented because it was part of the research and the development but it has been trashed by the new management. Mark you, he's still working for that same company. All right? So that's a way of mining some of these opportunities. Marketing and advertising opportunities. I mean, there's just so much more. I will not get into the specific details, but you go sit down and scan your workplace. Ask yourself, what it is that is offered to me at my workplace? And how can I start utilizing that? Can you become a consultant out there, an advisor out there with the knowledge that you've gained from your trainings? Can you use your networks, professional networks, to get you business for yourself or to get you higher paying jobs or to get you further training opportunities? So there's so, so much more, but this is a great challenge. You will not be able to build fallback plans unless you utilize all the opportunities at your workplace. They could give you an extra income. They could uh, open doors for greater opportunities for your growth. So um, ladies and gentlemen, Andy, allow me to reach there. And just as I close, um, as Andy mentioned, out of that very um, nasty experience, I was inspired enough to write a book, which is uh, right there on your screen, Beyond 8 to 5, Critical Lessons by Retrenchy. And in the book, I've um, highlighted checklists 
that will actually help you to think through some of these things that we have discussed and help you to put together your fallback plan. So as I close, I want to challenge you all to go out and build your fallback plan. Do not sleep tonight until you have started thinking through what is it that I can do tomorrow when you wake up, what, what is it that I'll start researching on? So there's endless possibilities, whether you're employed, whether you're running businesses, whether you're running your own business, there are still opportunities around you running your own business. You just need to sit down and scan them further and identify them and ask how can you maximize them. For example, for those who are in business so that um, you also get a bit of value from this. Are you able to offer a related service line to what you're currently doing with a different pricing point? Are you able to offer maybe the same service but at different pricing points or targeting different clientele just to diversify your income streams? So they saw so much more that need you to just sit down and think through what it is that you have and for sure I look forward to hearing that uh, you've been able to identify what fallback plan you will take up and that you're actually building upon. So thank you very much, Andy. Possibly I'll just see if there are some... Um... Andy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, well, let me... Kindly turn off your videos. Uh, I think we, we want to at least be able to focus more on the, on the speakers. Uh, but if you have any questions at this point, let me get this. Oh. All right, Andy. So um, I've been able to access the, the survey that we've done. Yes. So, so far we have uh, six responses. Mm -hmm. The only five questions. Yes. So let me read through so that uh, we see what we are dealing with. Yes. Do you have any passive income? 50% have said yes, 50% have said no. Okay. Second question, would you still be able to afford school fees in the same school? Out of the five responses, 60% say no. You know, only 20% have said yes. And 20% have said, maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. So we are dealing with a whooping 80% who will not be able to still meet the same obligations in the same school. Let's see. The next question was about um, hmm, living in the same house, same estate, same locality. So 50% have said yes. And the other 50%, no, maybe, I don't know. So again, you see where we are at. Eh? A very big percentage um, are not in a position to be able to pick, up their, to pick up or continue their livelihoods in the event of a job loss. Would you still maintain your car if you own one? 50%, no. 16%, maybe. So again, that's about 67% that are, will not be able to maintain their vehicles. Hmm. Now, the most interesting is, would you maintain your living standards as of today, grooming, charitable efforts? A whooping 70% said no. As in, it is so clear to 70% of us on the call that indeed, if there was a sudden life change, then we would not be able to maintain our living standards six months or one year down the line if you haven't found another job. And really that is uh, scary, but it no longer needs to be scary because now we have learned what options we can start exploring. So thank you very much, Andy. I'll end there. And um, I, I look forward to some further engagements. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy. That was quite a sobering presentation, but uh, quite true. It is uh, the reality, you know, this, 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 this sudden changes.
can come upon us and uh, mostly we might be found to be flat-footed. Um, and I think you've really given us quite a stark statistics of where we lie. Um, most of us, it seems we are quite unprepared, uh, but all in all, you've, you've provided some hope. Um, and I think you're quite a great role model that, uh, you know, we, we can be able to be resilient enough and be able to recover from such scenarios. Uh, and the key is really preparation and putting in place those fallback plans. And uh, you've given us quite a, quite a, quite a, quite a list that uh, we can begin acting on, you know, putting in place the insurance mechanism, you know, putting in place the emergency fund, putting in place, you know, the investments that uh, can be able to give us uh, um, some, some level of income, even when uh, we, we are at that point when we've lost our main livelihoods. Um, so I, I want to call on everyone now to, you know, begin, if you have any questions, um, you, if you wish to present them, uh, just raise your hand and uh, you can go ahead and unmute uh, your, your mic, I'll, I'll call on you. Um, alternatively, you can also post your questions on the chat box. Uh, please go ahead and do that. Um, before we do that, I, I do have a question of my own just to, as, as I uh, give uh, the participants some time to think through. So, um, at the time you lost your job, you know, a lot of us do have quite a level of pride in the organizations that you employed. It's, it's almost an extension of our identities. Um, and you know, when you get that sudden loss of, 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 of that job um, and association of the company that you are employed in, you know, many of us say, you know, I'm employed in a multinational, I'm employed in such and such a company. And you know, it's such, it's such, it causes such a level of pride and, um, you know, we have such an association with it such that if you lose it, it's sort of you lose yourself or your identity. Um, in reading your book, um, I, I got a glimpse of that, that you went through some level of, um, you know, um, realization of who you are um, and realizing that, uh, you know, you're not uh, KQ, uh, KQ is not you. How did you go through uh, that point and how did you overcome that, 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 um, that point where you, you, you know, after losing the job and you are in uh, such a major loss, how did you recover from it? How did you, you know, gain yourself a belief in who you are um, to be able to take steps towards now uh, developing uh, uh, fallback uh, measures and, uh, you know, seeing yourself beyond KQ and beyond an eight to five job? Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. That's a very loaded uh, question. Uh, wow. So um, the process of detachment from the identity that you've been used to is like um, dealing with a loss. I mean, any other loss. It's a very emotional experience. It's a very emotional journey. Because one minute you are able to identify with this class of people, with this brand, as you're saying, and the next minute is like you are never there really, you know? And I tell people that uh, when we lost our jobs, we were told that our emails would be deactivated, I think within, was it six hours or thereabout? And you had to return this and this and this. So it's just, the reality just ha has to hit you, you know? So when that reality hits you, that you're no longer even able to access the company with your, you know, with your security cards, reality starts hitting you. And there's no way you can deny that, you know? And I remember one time, I, I don't know what I had gone to do at the airport, and um, just after the job loss, honestly, you want to scream because uh, before you just go and swipe, the doors open, hi, Daisy, da-da-da. Now you're like a stranger. So Nanza Pale, Madam, sign there, you scanned. Who are you going to see? So just, I mean, it just flips like this. So the reality just dawns on you because of the change. The privileges that you enjoyed, you no longer enjoy within a second. Yeah. So it is a very emotional process. 
And that's where some people end up being depressed because they're not able to handle that fluctuation. So how did they deal with it? Number one, uh, at that point, I was already a member of a networking company. This is a marketing networking company. It's called New Life. I used to use the products, I mean, to manage the jet lag. So when I called um, one of the leaders, I'm like, guess what has happened? I'm so depressed. He told me, no, don't worry. Just come for the training tomorrow. And then we discuss further what to do. And for all of you who may have been engaged in a network marketing company, you know the energy, you can do it. One no should open the next door. So that positivity now engaging with this kind of people helped me to sort of manage the depression. And they gave me a hope that even if I don't have the big salary now, maybe I can start rebuilding a small income with them. So for me, I didn't take long time. I think within a day or two, I had gone to one of those trainings and the energy had infected me. Number two was books. From um, an early age, I've always been a reader. So when traveling, I used to buy a lot of books and mostly self-help groups. Eh? So I really uh, immersed myself in the books, books that give you hope, books that now tell you, you know, you can do it, you have what it takes, you know, challenges can be surmounted. So reading books really, really helped me to overcome this. Uh, number three, spiritual nourishment. Hey, Andy, I really looked for God that time. Eh? So when trouble comes, let me tell you, you, you search for God yourself. You go knocking on doors. God, are you here? I'm desperate. I need you. So I had um, my connection and my relation with God went to another level. You know, the level of desperation, the level of brokenness. Who for if you're Christian, you know that there's a verse that says that God loves a contrite and broken heart. So when you're so broken, you're desperate, you have no income, everything is crashing, you've disposed of your car, you've had to move to a much cheaper house. I mean, putting food on the table became a challenge. I remember I told some people that we survived on uh, what are these things called? Indomil. Indomie. Getting a packet of Indomie was a miracle, you know, at 25 shillings. That was a miracle that time when the case was still in court. So having a spiritual uh, journey and awakening also really helped me because then I hang on to the promises of God's word. Affliction will not rise a second time. I will restore you. Have faith for a better tomorrow. So I really hang on, on to that. Eh? And finally, what else can I say? Um, there's something that happens when you leave a place. And I think uh, Professor Ndemo uh, alluded to this. When he left the government, he says that uh, his phone was no longer ringing. And at one point, he thought that his phone was actually um, spoiled. The reality is people will, a lot of people will actually desert you yeah a lot of people will sort of uh, now keep distance because i i don't know i think maybe they think now you you will be bugging them for for all your needs eh? so when that thing happens reality just hits you and you have to get a new set of um community around you new set of friends people that now are relating with the new you so I think that is what I would say. There's a lot, but I think that's in a nutshell, that's how I would say I managed, I coped. Wow, thanks for sharing that. So having a strong support system, your, your, your spiritual foundation and your faith, books um, where you can learn from others and, and realize that uh, it's, it's not just you alone. Um, and it's not because of you. You know, I think sometimes we tend to think, why did they pick on me out of hundreds of other employees? Why me? Is there something that I'm missing? Um, and I think you, you've put it so well in the book that, um, that we should all, you know, know that we are enough. Um, it, it, it's not anything personal. It's not because of you. Um, I remember um, the other day I was watching Sober Sundays by Pastor, uh, Pastor Simon Bevy. And uh, in one of, one of the panelists, uh, Mr. Julian, um, say that business is selfish in nature. So, you know, they take this 
certain steps really for, for its own survival. And, and, and it's got nothing to do with your capability, who you are and the like. So let's all develop good support system, our families, the networks that we maintain. You know, let's also maintain that faith and spiritual foundation that uh, keeps us grounded even in times of change. So we've gotten quite a number of comments here. People saying, thank you, Daisy, for being vulnerable and sharing in your experience. You know, you have quite a powerful story and it's good that you put it in a book because that, you know, it, it, it will live forever, even after you've gone. Uh, and it's, it's something that people can look to. Even people who have never met you, you know, can, can be able to relate to that story. Um, Dennis said, uh, thank you. That was a great presentation, really sobering. Um, um, we also got comments from uh, Mary Mutinda, uh, Mary Ndinda, uh, and she said also quite a sobering uh, presentation, but so, so true. Thank you very much for sharing um, your, your story. Any questions? Wow, I don't know if the presentation really made people <laughs> really <laughs> um, have quite an uh, introspection period. Uh, Allow me to say something. There's something you said that triggered something in me. Yes. Um, Yes, in the book, I do say don't take it personal because um, we were retrenched in September. And I remember in the month of August, I had actually won an excellence award, you know. I had won an excellence award. I had saved the company. Was it 9 million? There's a project I undertook, what they call world-class organization. You know, it's like clean management or Kaizen principles. So under the catering aspect, I had reworked a few things and I had saved uh, the company about 9 million in I think the six months period. And I had won an excellence award, which was given to us on August, I think 8th. So when the letters came on 4th of September, I'm like, there must be a mistake, you know? There must be a mistake. So what I always tell people is, when these things happen, don't take it personal. I mean, just deal with it. And at the end of the day, God also could be, um, not could be, God is always, always ahead of you. He always uses whatever that, you know, that's a negative situation, that, um, um, that very challenging situation to always shoot you onto a, a, a better position. So once people acknowledge this, they'll be better placed to handle their situation and whatever challenge that still they are going through. But don't leave yourself to fit. Have a fallback plan. We don't want you so desperate and depressed. Yes. Thank you very much, Daisy. Uh, for sharing that. Um, yes, uh, we've just also received some more comments right here, one from Rosemary Kanyo. Um, thank you, Daisy. It's quite an inspiring, it's a reality check. I think it's that, that's, that's really, that's really it. You've really, you know, put the mirror be, before us to, you know, telling us that really, uh, do we, can we live off just the single income stream that we are all reliant on, or should we now develop, you know, both passive and non-passive income streams that can be able to help us when our main income stream is uh, cut off or lost in one way or the other. Um, thank you, Silvana. Uh, I'll be sharing the recording, so you'll have uh, the presentation in there. Um, so we have about uh, six minutes left uh, before we close. Um, let me share the, maybe the, there's a survey that you had shared. I don't know if everyone can see it. Let me post it afresh. For those that happen to have missed the survey that uh, Daisy shared, I'm posting it. I'm reposting it again. Uh, you can find it there. That's a good uh, practice that you can take to really question yourself on where you are in terms of your fallback plans. So take a moment, go through it. Um, it's quite a short, it should take you a minute or two. Um, before we wrap up, I think I'll be sharing, let me share my um, um, a registration form. If you would you wish to be part of the AM Book Club, um, you can register through this form. Um, and we also wish to request for your feedback. 
tell us uh, more about other topics that we should uh, put on on the on this on this webinar series. Would really appreciate your input and tell us was it good, was it bad, where can we improve. Would really appreciate uh, those 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 uh, that, that feedback to help us, you know, continually improve ourselves. Um, Daisy, any any final um, word that you wish to share with us before we close? Um, yes, I see Coletta has her hand raised. I don't know if she has something to say before I close in a minute. Yes, uh, Coletta, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you, Daisy. I met Daisy, I think, four or five years ago when we were in a class together doing a, an entrepreneurship course. And I had no clue that, um, Daisy, you had um, gone through such a situation. You were always very vibrant and very positive. And now I can say that I, I understand the, the energy that I saw you putting into into your business and um, so we've communicated a little bit since and I've come to learn your story and I totally agree with the you know the things that you're talking about just the need to be prepared because that's how you build resilience so thanks very much for being vulnerable and for just being bold and courageous to share these lessons with us All right, thank you so much, Coletta. Indeed, it's a small world. And um, I think we need a lot of time, more time. And to talk about social capital. It does amazing things. Uh, so for my closing remarks, I'll just say two things. As we go out to build our fallback plans, I'll quote what Maya Ang Angelo says. I hope I pronounced that right. If you know better, you do better, right? So let's be open to constant learning. The more you learn, the better you will be at living your life and growing yourself. So you know better, you do better. And then finally, think of your income as a sources of income as a three-legged stool. Three-legged stool. So if one of those uh, legs breaks, you might be wobbly, but you'll still sort of be standing. So when you're thinking of your fallback plans, ask yourselves, do I have my three legs of the stool intact? Because if you're standing, you can imagine a one-legged stool, you know? Imagine yourself standing on one leg. If somebody touches you and pushes you, can you go to just a little bit? You definitely find yourself on the floor. So think of that always when you're thinking of a fallback plan. Ask yourself, what other leg can I add to my incomes? You know, so that if one occurrence shakes off the one leg or it breaks or it is hurt, then you don't fall down. You'd rather wobble a little bit and your other fallback plans, they hold you up. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say, Andy. I'm greatly honored to, um, to learn and uh, to appear on this webinar and I look forward to more engaging sessions in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy. Wow, that was quite an illuminating and, um, you know, as we had said earlier, uh, sobering session. Um, I think one thing that I've taken away is also this idea of taking full responsibility of yourself. I think many a times we really get, you know, things that we should be responsible for to others, that to our parents, to the government, to our employers. Um, but we realize everything really comes down to us. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's one of the more, you know, sobering messages that uh, this, this presentation has really um, been able to illuminate. And I really want to thank you for uh, dedicating your time, sharing your time, sharing your wisdom with us and, um, and uh, you know, coming on to this session to, to present what to share your, your story. Um, how can somebody get the book? 
if somebody wants to get this book, how, how can they how can they get? Is it available in the bookshop? Do they can they contact you? And which through which number? All right. Uh, thanks, Andy. So my book is available on uh, our book on my book site, which is www. I'll uh, share it on the chat. Mm -hmm. Dot okay. beyond mm -hmm. eight to five. Dot co. Dot ke. So that is a fully e-commerce website. So you'll be able to order for a book, either an e-book or a hard copy. If it's an e-book, it will be 500 shillings. Once you pay through the system, then the book is delivered instantly to your email. If you choose the hard copy, it's 800 shillings, including delivery countrywide. So we will be able to get your delivery location through the form that you fill and we'll dispatch your book within uh, 24 hours. Uh, besides that, if you'd like to chat me up on WhatsApp for just personal matters, inquiries, and money market fund, please uh, chat me on 0780, that's my Airtel line, 002144. So that's the line you can get me on. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. So you've got uh, Daisy's uh, contacts right there. So you can go to beyond www.beyond825.co.ke and through that you can either purchase both the e-copy or the hard copy uh, versions of, of our book. Um, if you wish to reach, reach out to her, you can contact her on that number. So do pen it down. So it's 0780 uh, um, she is quite a resource. You learn quite a great deal from her. Um, yes, so please do, do take advantage of that. Thank you once again, Daisy, uh, for being quite open. And uh, Allow me, Andy, to just mention yeah. my social media handle, please. Yes. Yeah, please. so Facebook, please uh, like our page, Beyond 8 to 5. Instagram, Beyond 8 to 5 p.m. Twitter, at beyond eight to five. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. And with that, I want to thank you all for uh, attending this session and for sharing your, your comments, your questions, uh, and for participating throughout the session. Um, thanks once again to Daisy. We look forward to having now again on uh, the AM Book Club webinar series um, to, to hear more from her. And with that, good night and goodbye. All right. Thank you. Goodbye and good night.